Ja, de er på det første. Det er første. Det er, det er. Ja, så er den karakter. Der er stadig, I var efter at finde mikrofonen til. Should I put the microphone? Okay. Well, uh, well, I want to thank first Eyal, Eyal Gross, Eyal Zeta, uh, for their very nice introduction and for uh, bringing me here, the Tel Aviv University, the Safra Center, the Center for Food Studies. It's a great honor to be here and a great pleasure as well. Uh, well, I'm also very honored to be a contributor because I always feel uh, I'm a food writer, I'm not an academic, and I'm not a lawyer or anything. <laughs> so it's a great honor. I always look up to lawyers and academics to be part of, of that. And even though I cannot read the book, it's in here. I'm going to, <laughs> I, I met the contributors last night and uh, uh, heard a bit about them, managed to get, so I'm, I'm terribly glad to be part of them as well. Well, so not being an academic, my talk will really reflect my experiences researching cooking across the Mediterranean, which has been my patch, really for 60 years from when I started collecting recipes. Now, I was asked to talk about uh, the role of food in culture. Well, everything to do with food, from agriculture, animal husbandry, hunting and fishing, to the way we shop, cook, eat, and entertain is culture. Uh, cooking is especially important because it impacts everyday life for everybody. Taste is the most personal of our senses, but it is acquired and cultivated in society. Our comfort foods can reveal our provenance and ethnicity, our religion, our ideology, aspirations, and our place in society. So I don't know what full mesdames places us. <laughs> uh, full mesdames, yes, not quite. Um, but, uh, but yes, that is something about, yes, taking from, uh, because the Jewish quarter in Egypt used to make full mesdames for Saturday. They put it on Friday night. It wasn't us. We used to make sofrito. Uh, but when we went to Paris, full mesdames was what we, we ate and what we took out of a tin as well. Now, for, the, for Jews, the observance of religious dietary laws created a spiritual atmosphere around food. In the past and for many still today, cooking revolves around the Sabbath and religious festivals. Celebrations are ruled by tradition and special foods are part of these traditions and they play a role in the rituals, uh, sometimes symbolic roles. The abidance by the kosher laws acted as a barrier to intermingling with non-Jews and ensured the perpetuation of a way of life and an identity. As a migrating people, food has represented continuity, roots, and identity to Jews. And it's been a way of remembering generations past and vanished worlds. And of course, Shabbat dinner and the holiday table keeps families together. Now, food is about sustenance and pleasure, but it's also about hospitality and conviviality and creating bonds between people. I come from a society where to entertain a guest is the greatest joy, and where hospitality and offering food um, is an all-important part of life. Among the happy memories of my childhood in Egypt is the times with the extended family. We were a very large family, the Duex, the Sassoons, the Alfandaris, and so on. And we uh, got together either for celebrations, for festivals, sat at long tables, the grown-ups at one end, the children at the other end, and when we also did the rounds, visiting all the relatives uh, for festive occasions, my father said there were strict rules that we always visit the older ones first, and then you go by age. And we found the extended family always sitting in a large circle, and we kissed everybody. 
And depending on the time of day, we would serve Turkish coffee and uh, with spoon jams and pasties or meze with drinks. Now, I realized that food was about roots and identity when I first started collecting recipes. It was in 1956 when the Jews left Egypt suddenly en masse after the Suez crisis. I was an art student in London at, my, at that time and my parents arrived as refugees. We were inundated for quite a few years going on and on with family and friends passing through London on their way to some new homeland. Everyone was exchanging recipes in a desperate kind of way. Before that, people never exchanged recipes, but there we did. And they were saying, give me your recipe for lahma bahajin, for kibbeneyev, your hummus, your date preserve, the orange cake. I might never see you again. It will be something to remember you by. So, uh, this was the thing that we really thought we would never see Egypt again and we would never see each other again. Uh, we didn't know. Some took out a little handwritten notebook and we sat down together uh, to go through them. In Egypt, they would never have given me a recipe. There had been no cookbooks at all. Recipes were jealously kept in families and not given away except with at least one or two mistakes. <laughs> but now we all wanted to preserve something that had made our lives happy in the world that was now vanished. Uh, we weren't in competition anymore. We weren't rivals. Now, the recipes that I was con collecting were a mixed bag because Egypt had been a cosmopolitan society with many minorities. And the Jewish community itself was a mosaic of families from all over the Ottoman Empire and beyond. My grandparents came from Aleppo, three of them, and one from originally from Istanbul. The women uh, who gave me recipes said they were their mothers or their grandmothers. Uh, so you can date those recipes that are in the book. If they were uh, my mother's age, those who gave me, and they were their mothers and their grandmothers. But they still, now people are cooking them like that because when I go to Lebanon, when I go to Egypt, they're still, uh, and the people continue cooking that way. Now, uh, the women who gave me recipes, yes, said their mothers or their grandmothers from Aleppo, Izmir, Istanbul, Tunis, Baghdad, Livorno, and so on. And so I realized about the geography. Now, uh, they also added little bits of story, how as children they were given to make uh, the lisan alas four, which was uh, bird's tongues or orzo. I don't know how you call it here, these little tiny oval bits of pasta. They would make them with their fingers. And uh, they would tell me those kinds of story. Also, you call it, and um, yeah. And some people would tell me how in the old Jewish quarter uh, they put the pans of broad beans and hard-boiled eggs to cook in the ashes of the fire of the public baths on Friday night and collected them on Saturday. I don't know if any of you here <laughs> have uh, know about that or had this experience. Now, the French writer Edgar Morin, a Jew from Salonika, explained the importance of food for his community in his book, Vidal et les siens, Vidal and, and his people. Gastronomy, he wrote, is the kernel of a culture, and that for Salonikans, uh, pastelikos is the kernel of the kernel of the kernel. So for some, he said, pastelikos is all that is left of their culture. Pastelicos are little pies filled with minced meat and fried onions, cinnamon, and allspice. Uh, every community has their own pastelicos. When I visited my aunt Yvette in Los Angeles, she always immediately brought out kibbe, sambusek, babaranoush from the freezer. Uh, and these were her pastelicos. And these are also the foods 
that millions of refugees today yearn for all the time. Now, to refugees and immigrants, food is that part of their culture that survives the longest, passed on from one generation to another, kept up even when long clothing, language, music have been dropped or forgotten. It's also the way that an immigrant co uh, community insinuates its culture in a new homeland. Different groups of immigrants to Britain brought great gastronomic achievement. So, uh, any of you who were in London in the 50s and 60s, as I was, uh, know that it was the once the worst place on earth to eat. And now it's a gastronomic capital of the world, where every type of restaurant and food is represented. Actually, not only represent, but our supermarkets. Our supermarkets are like an international Aladdin's cave of everything. Now, when, um, when uh, my first uh, Middle Eastern cookbook, I know that here you called it Mediterranean. Uh, although, was it called Ruth? Oh, so it the was the taste of the east. East, okay. So I thought that I keep telling everybody you didn't like the name Middle Eastern, so you called it Mediterranean, but I, it was wrong. Okay, so it was a taste of the east as well, separate. It's a different thing. Okay, and think well. Uh, it came out. The first book came out 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago. Uh, people at the time would ask me, is it going to be sheep size and testicles? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and because uh, to write a cookery book at the time was the le comble du ridicule. Why would you want to write a cookbook? Uh, but also to write it about the Middle East, uh, that was really the end. But they also made, when the book came out, made jokes about the names. Hummus in English, or humus is the decomposed plant matter that gardeners put in the soil. And for full mesdames, they called it, uh, sorry, uh, for full mesdames, they called it foul mesdames. <laughs> so that was the thing. Well, uh, now everything Middle Eastern is, the, is trendy. Wow. You find a whole Middle Eastern meze in supermarkets. A tray with the whole Middle Eastern meze, the vine leaves, the hummus, the babaranu, everything is there. And a recent survey revealed that, two surveys, one that it was 41% of the population of British households had hummus in their fridge. And another poll found out that it was 45%. Wow. Well, uh, now Israeli chefs are celebrated and emulated. Really, everyone copies them. As soon as they start putting a recipe on Instagram, well, it's in the magazines, and it's also in Marks and Spencer. You know, <laughs> within a few days of something coming in the column and a photograph, yes, there's all these people working at Marks and Spencer who are there looking to see what's the next thing that's going to be trendy. Now, Britain has gradually uh, integrated things Middle Eastern and created a fusion cuisine that represents an interweaving of cultures. Our eclectic modern menus in restaurants and gastropubs, those of you who come and go to gastropubs, uh, you will find they're full of bulgur, couscous, filo pastry. Now, everybody knows it you know, better than you do, I think, <laughs> almost. Tahina, you know, pomegranate molasses, date molasses, harissa, preserved lemons, rose water. Uh, I also, what has happened that the revelation that the fried fish of the British national dish, fish and chips, is a Jewish import. It's now constantly repeated in the media and on TV. I, I put it in, in my book. I didn't invent it, and I also copied it from somewhere. So, <laughs> but uh, some researcher had 
well, a long time ago, find that Joseph Malin, a Jewish immigrant newly arrived from Eastern Europe, started selling fish and chips in 1860. He was the first person. He adopted the way of frying fish in batter from the Portuguese Jews who had settled in the East End um, a century and more before him. And the chips were take, was borrowed from the Irish chippies who were also in the East End at the same time. And now it was also Jews who started fish and chip shops after him all the way to Scotland as well. Now, food connects us not only to family and society, but with history and geography as well. I became aware that dishes had history behind them 60 years ago when I asked a librarian at the British Library for Arab cookbooks. He told me to come back the next day and uh, when he found something, he'd find something for me. There was nothing contemporary, no Arab cookbook. There's a millions now, I should think. But he gave me a handwritten list of publications, all on medieval Arab gastronomy. One was a 1939 translation of a 13th century culinary manual found in Baghdad by Professor Arbery. He had added poems of the time celebrating food. Another was an analysis of a culinary manuscript of the same period, 13th century, found in Damascus by the French Marxist Orientalist Maxime Rodinson. When he was stranded there in Damascus there with the French army during the Second World War, he used, to, he used it to explain a court cuisine and a society that existed more than 700 years before. It became his PhD thesis. There was also a, pan, um, a Spanish translation from the Arabic of a Maghrebi Andalusian culinary manuscript. I was enthralled. I started, uh, the way people who start looking into medieval food, you can believe that people do get enthralled and they want to cook the dishes. And so did I. I uh, always started entertaining friends to a medieval banquets. I had a long table and there we were at medieval banquets. Many of the dishes had similar names, similar combinations of ingredients and, and flavors and spices and similar techniques as well to those I was hearing from people leaving Egypt. I was sort of remembering their, what they were saying and then seeing something similar in the Middle East. I was thrilled, for instance, to find a recipe like the one my Aunt Regine gave me uh, for treya. We called it treya, and there it was, called treya as well. And it was chicken with pasta, flavored with a mix of spices, uh, and it was with the same name in the Damascus manuscript. It made me feel that my family had extended roots into an exciting imagined past. Well, when my, there was I uh, bringing up a family, and when my children uh, left home, all at the same time, literally at the same day, uh, two to go to New York for a year and one to go to university in Manchester, I decided I will leave two on the same day. <laughs> and to travel, I didn't want to stay alone at home. I was a single mom at the time. All around, the Me I started deciding to travel uh, around the Mediterranean. I went à l'aventure. I tasted everything I could, and I asked everybody I met what they ate, what regions, regions they came from, what their parents and grandparents did and cooked. It gave me a reason to accost people uh, in a pension, in a restaurant, on a bench, and to engage them in conversation. You see, at the time, it was uh, unusual for anybody to ask a recipe and to strangers. And I would explain, I'm an English journalist. Well, later I became an English journalist. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would say they never, uh, they never uh, accepted the English, but they accepted the journalist who interested in food. Uh, somebody told me like this when I said I'm English, no, <laughs> who, are you? who are you? 
<laughs> but uh, uh, people were always glad to talk about their food to a stranger. On a train in Italy, for instance, I had many experiences, but the kind of experience, I asked a woman sitting near me what her favorite dishes were and how she cooked them. And she started telling me, soon all the all uh, parts of the train, or rather the carriage, were all there saying, that's not how I cook it, <laughs> you know, so you would. But they were still, it was still within a range. It was a dish. Now, uh, I started with a few contacts, and I was introduced and passed on to others. People in Marrakesh said, I have a cousin in Fez, one in Casablanca. Are you going there? So I, I would travel on, be told, given an address, given a phone number. I was often invited to watch people cook, sometimes by strangers. At uh, that time, I was worried about my children, where they were going. Some of them were going off traveling. And they said, well, what about you? You know, <laughs> I had less experience than them to travel around. And we are worried about where you're going, and you go and eat in, in strangers' houses. <laughs> uh, now, there is a certain intimacy in the kitchen that you don't have when you are entertained in the living room. You should try that. If you're an anthropologist, don't go to the living room. <laughs> we exchange very personal stories. So part of the pleasure uh, of researching for me has been getting to know people, being part of their lives for a moment, and enjoy the special conviviality around food. I had glorious dishes. I discovered everywhere a world where I felt at home, and the and the Mediterranean became the focus of my work ever since. The French historian, Fernand Brodel, wrote that if you are from any part of the Mediterranean, you are never a stranger along its shores. And it was true for me. I felt that. The countries around the Mediterranean are very different. There are forests and deserts and mountains and islands. And they all have different histories, different cultures, Eastern and Western, Christian and Muslim. But the regions bordering the sea have a lot in common, more in common with each other, I found, than with parts of their own countries, either in the North or the South. Now, when you drive, for instance, in France, when you drive towards the sea, it feels at a certain point towards the Mediterranean, I should say. You have opened the door into another world. The sky is different, the light and colors are different, the vegetation and architecture are different. People talk in a different way. There is a certain way of being and a certain way of living that is familiar. The Mediterranean climate allows for an easygoing outdoor life, for al fresco eating, food festivals, street foods, and markets. You see similar produce everywhere. Olive oil, olives, goat and sheep's cheeses, charcuterie, great bundles of herbs, piles of spices, of course, the grains, the, sea, the grains, the pulses, the same fruit and vegetables, seafood and meat, and also the same utensils, the clay pots, the pestles and mortar, the skewers, the Mediterranean custom, many customs in the Mediterranean of serving an assortment of little dishes with drinks is a feature of life. And a meal is a place of interaction. It's not the way, uh, it's not a place of interaction all over the world, but certainly it is in the Mediterranean. I can hear here, the interaction is pretty loud, and it is loud, it was for us in our family. Uh, Spaniards say that their Mediterranean regions, as opposed to other parts, are an, a an area of alegría de vivir. Unfortunately, the Mediterranean is not exactly joie de vivre at the moment. Every country has its own cuisine, and there are differences between town and country, and from one town and village to another. But you can see similar dishes from one end of the sea to the other. 
the Brandade of, of uh, salt cod in Venice, it, the same as the one in Provence and the one in Catalonia. The chicken cooked with grapes of Spain is the same as one in Tuscany. The octopus stews of Greece and Provence are the same. There are broad bean purees and aubergine purees everywhere. A tomato sauce with fried onions and garlic is the signature tune of the entire Med Mediterranean. It's the incestuous history of the area with the same empires and settlers from the Phoenicians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, the Ottomans, uh, uh, all to, uh, being part, part of the area in, in big, big chunks taking over. And the intense maritime traffic and the trading activity between all the port cities that shaped the cuisines and brought a certain culinary unity around the sea. Every little bit of the Mediterranean has its own culinary stories. Have I got 50 minutes in all by the time? Because have we lost a lot of time? No, no, we, yeah. I'm wondering. How long do you still need? You need uh, you're okay, don't worry. Yeah, well, Italy especially is an example um, of stories. Now, Italy's great regional diversity is a legacy of the country's division until unification a century and a half ago in many independent sovereign states, each with its own history, culture, and cooking tradition. The regional cooking reflects the history of the old states. And Italian food is also an example of the way cooking reflects um, uh, not only history and the past, but the way it was once lived in that, in that part. Many of the people I interviewed said they were from families of 10 who lived on the land. Actually, they all had one child then, by then, uh, which was sad to me at any rate. Uh, but they, they came from, uh, uh, from those kinds of families. That was 30 years ago and more. In Tuscany, until the 1960s, before peasants abandoned the land for factories, um, a system of sharecropping prevailed by which peasant farmers lived on estates as tenants and cultivated the land, giving half the produce to the landlord as rent. Estates were large and divided into fields, each housing a family community. Peasants were busy all the year growing wheat, maize, rice, vegetables and fruit. Wine was made on each estate, and in many also olive oil, well, in the south and in and, and the center. Every farm kept pigs, rabbits, poultry, and they bred a few of them calves. They made cheese and cured pork. Now, when this system of sharecropping was abolished and landowners found themselves without workers, they sold their properties cheap to people from Milan and Rome, and to foreigners. I think some of you might have. So I, I do realize that Israelis buy land or buy <laughs> <laughs> houses in Tuscany now. And to foreigners who use the farmhouses as holiday homes. Entrepreneurs from the north came to farm in a modern, intensive way. The old agriculture of intermingled vines, mulberries, and olive trees on the hill slope it's called promiscuous agriculture, with little patches of wheat, maize, and pulses, where the large families of tenants had spent their days fighting their way through the entanglements to pick everything by hand, were replaced by a single crop industrial agriculture. Tomatoes, uh, olive trees, uh, courgettes, well, that way. Country life changed dramatically. But the dishes that were born in the old life never disappeared, and they are now very, very much in fashion. A few small farmers continue in the old archaic way of very mixed cultivation, and their bit of landscape has remained like the background in Renaissance paintings. Now, Spaniards, like Italians, because I did long research in Italy and Spain, for several, it took me a long time going to all the regions. Now, the Spaniards, too, are as passionate about their cuisines and their terroir. The late Catalan writer, José Pla, has a beautiful way of describing cooking. 
he said it was the landscape in a saucepan. And it really does evoke what it is. He was talking about Catalonia, which has many very distinctive styles of cooking, of the sea, the mountains. Very often it's in the same place. So you have mari montagna dishes, means sea and mountain, because the cliffs are right up by the sea. And the cooking of the Ebro mountain, as well as the cooking of the Barcelona bourgeoisie. But when I was researching Spain, I found that the ghosts of the past were in the saucepans too, and on the plates. Spanish food is full of clues about the country's past. But when I told people that I was researching the history of their food in Italy, they always had plenty of stories about the history of their food. But in Spain, I realized that the history of food, like the history of Spain, is a very sensitive subject. An olive oil producer in Cordoba, for instance, as soon as I told him that, he volunteered that there had been a long controversy about Spanish culture. Was it Roman or was it Arab? After a lot of argument, he said, it was decided that it was Roman. At a dinner in Madrid, the hostess Antonieta, when I told her that, she said, I have to no, uh, you have to know, Claudia, that we are of Roman and Visigoth stock. She was angry, she said, as the way foreigners are always noticing Moorish architecture. Did you see the Roman aqueduct in Segovia? <laughs> uh, for centuries, the country had wiped out its Muslim and Jewish past from national memory, but now, the legacies of the once huge population of Muslims and significant minority of Jews have become a matter of interest and fascination to chefs. Well, when I visited El Molino, a restaurant and center of gastronomic research outside Granada, where they hold courses on the history of Spanish food, I asked about the origins of the food and was told, Arab and Jewish. And I said, well, give me an example. Well, he gave roast pork as an example. <laughs> and then he explained, when they converted to Christianity, they cooked pork in the way they used to cook lamb, which was to rub it with cumin seeds. Uh, if you go to, to uh, Fino's in London, the restaurant, you will find in the crackling one or two or three cumin seeds. So that's uh, how in the roast belly of pork. So it, one seed can tell you uh, something about the past. Now pork was a symbol of the reconquista and the reconquering of Spain. And it became a tool of the Inquisition when inquisitors always entered homes at mealtime to check that converted Jews and Muslims uh, cooked with pork fat and pork products. That is when the custom of putting tiny bits of pork or ham in every possible dish, including vegetables and fi soups and fish dishes, that took root at that time. Because converts, as well as old Christians, were forced to show proof of their allegiance to Christianity. Well, when I ate berenjenas, I was going to say berenjenas as the lad, lad, in Ladino, but in uh, Spain, berenjenas con miel, was first fried aubergines with honey in the town of Priego de Cordoba. The chef came to sit with me and he told me about Ziryab, a Kurdish lute player from the court of Harun al-Rashid in Baghdad, who joined the court of Cordoba and introduced new music and new ways of cooking. Other chefs in Andalusia were always mentioning to me Ziryab. He's very popular at the moment, as did also flamenco musicians, uh, they mention it. Now, Priego di Cordoba is on the Ruta del Califato. It's a tourist, tourist route of Muslim Spain. There's another tourist route in Spain, and it's the Camino Sefarad, through areas some of you maybe have gone uh, to see where the Jews once lived. 
uh, and so it's um, uh, so where they lived uh, before the expansion in 1492. Some of my ancestors came from Spain. My grandmother Eugenie Alfandari, who was from Istanbul, spoke Ladino with her friends. Their names were Toledano, Cuenca, Carmona, Leon, Curiel. The way people cooked in Spain, the ingredients they put together, their little tricks and turn of hand were to me mysteriously familiar. A flavor, an aroma, suddenly triggered memories and emotions I never knew I had. It's surprising how dishes can appeal directly to the emotions. Food, like music, can touch you and make you cry. Well, food has many powers. Last December, I was in Amsterdam for the awards ceremony of the Prince Klaus Fund for Culture and Development. It gives awards to the developing world. Some countries get out of the developing world, like China and India, who are rich now, and others join. The, so I had written the laudation for Kamal Muzawak, a food activist in Lebanon, who started a movement that helps. He's actually a chef who doesn't cook. That's what he says, <laughs> or who doesn't like recipes. But, <laughs> but he calls himself a food activist. And, um, and uh, he started a movement that helps small-scale uh, farmers and artisans, runs farmers markets and food festivals, as well as educational programs for schools and catering courses for refugees. In his little Beirut restaurant called Taulet, each day a different home cook, usually a woman from a different part of Lebanon, prepares the specialities of her region and community. Other towelets, little restaurants like that, operating in the same way, have opened elsewhere in the country. I met Kamal when we were both judges in a couscous competition in San Vito Lo Capo in Sicily. Israel and Palestine won jointly. I have to say that we were a gr long, big group of jurors, mostly Italian journalists, and one of the organizers came saying, I hope you don't mind, but you would like us, them to win. <laughs> Do you accept? We accepted. <laughs> anyway, they came, the teams, they came with their teams. They presented their dishes, marching with their flags as in the Olympics. <laughs> and to the tune of the Hatigva <laughs> and Fidai. And they held their cup up high together, uh, and, uh, and a sea, uh, sea um, actress in a tiara and an evening dress presented the cup. And there, it was a great occasion, and, uh, and uh, Morocco did not accept the result. <laughs> and we <laughs> so Kamal was my host when I was researching the food of Lebanon. He took me to visit artisan producers in mountain villages. We stopped in Zdahle, in the Bekaa Valley, where, according to legend, the special character of the Lebanese Meze was born, and where my father occasionally, from Egypt, went there to recover from an illness or something. Now, I was a guest on his TV program with two Palestinian women and others, uh, but the two Palestinian women were from an organic peasants' cooperative. They brought baskets full of fresh produce, including lentils on the plant and wild herbs, as well as some of the foods they had made. They had made with borgol and, and other things. Lebanon is a tiny country with many different ethni ethnicities, ethnicities and religions and cultures, and you know it better than I do. Sunni and Shiite, Druze, Syrian Christian, Maronite, Greek Orthodox Armenian, still hostile and suspicious of each other after their long and de devastating civil war. But it is also a country with strong traditions of hospitality and conviviality. I think, to me, more than anywhere in the world that I noticed. Uh, where gastronomy is an important part of culture and cooking traditions are linked with identity, history, and cultural heritage. At the new farmers' markets, 
people from different ethnicities, religions, and classes socialize without fear of violence. And farmers get a fair price without forming ties with, with, while forming ties with each other and their customers. The Taulet restaurants celebrate the culinary diversity of Lebanon and bring people together from embattled and marginalized communities. Now, being around Kamal, to me, was a lesson on the power of food to bring people together and make them feel loved and valued to celebrate identity and, at the same time, build bridges. His, his message is make food, not war. It is politics through gastronomy in a revolutionary kind of way. Now, at, uh, at uh, the gala dinner in Amsterdam, when he received the prize, um, uh, uh, the Dutch royal family came to, of course, attended the royal um, the banquet. Syrian women, refugees in Lebanon and in Holland cooked part of the gala dinner for 300 people. They made dishes like kibbe stewed with quins that you don't get on a standard restaurant menus. There was a great excitement in the kitchen. People were running inside and out to see what they were doing. There was great excitement, and when they came uh, out of the kitchen, they got a standing ovation. A year ago in February, I attended a gala dinner in Istanbul to celebrate the invitation by UNESCO to the city of Gaziantep to be part of their Creative Cities Network in the field of gastronomy. There's only a few cities in the world have been chosen by UNESCO to be creative cities of gastronomy. But despite what the city is going through, with 350,000 refu Syrian refugees in their midst and ISIL fighters passing in and out, it had just inaugurated an institute of gastronomy. The mayor of Gaziantep, a woman, said they wanted to protect their famous gastronomy. And at their institute, they taught women, disabled people, Syrian refugees, how to cook professionally. Women are not normally accepted in the all-male uh, professional kitchens of Turkey. Now, in 2010, food was for the first time officially recogni recognized by UNESCO as part of the intangible cultural uh, history of humanity when they put the gastronomic meal of the French on their list. It was the meal, uh, not recipes. Then they added traditional Mexican cuisine. And then uh, everybody lobbies to have their cuisines done. Now, a particular Japanese cuisine came next. And what came next was the Mediterranean diet. Uh, but they did, with diet, they don't mean the, the uh, um, uh, pyramid with a tiny bit of meat at the top <laughs> and all that. They mean everything to do with food and around food. Uh, 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 not, uh, not the diet as we know the word diet. Uh, and they, they have given these, um, recognized them as endangered culinary treasures that needed valuing and safeguarding. I have to say that it's the Catalans who have been uh, lobbying for the Mediterranean diet because for years, I've known all the people who were lobbying for Catalan dishes. They had a list of their dishes to be, to be uh, recognized, but Spain always uh, stopped it. They didn't want the Catalan uh, culture to be recognized separately from Spain. But so they started lobbying for the Mediterranean diet because they see themselves as the great, uh, they were, uh, for 200 years, the queen of the Mediterranean. And they're responsible for spreading the culture. Um, now, in the last 30 years, the Mediterranean area has seen dramatic changes in social and economic structures. The industrialization of agriculture and food production and globalization. Once people cooked what 
their parents cooked, and recipes and techniques were passed from mother to daughter. They never wanted to cook from somewhere else, not at all from the next region. Today, even in Italy, Mama no longer spends all day cooking in the kitchen, and Italians search on the internet for recipes. Traditional cuisines are a fragile living heritage that can easily be lost. But does it matter if traditional cuisines are lost? In most countries, it matters for tourism, since part of the pleasure of visiting a country is the local food. It's lucky that you've got your local uh, Israeli cuisine now. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just in time now. It matters to e uh, economies because countries can, make easily, can more easily sell their traditional products. It matters to the world because of the loss of cultural diversity. Otherwise, we're all going to be the same. Uh, at one time, it was all led by Californian. Now, it's all over the place. But people copy each other in this global cuisine. It matters for the local inhabitant because it reinforces their identity and gives them pride and dignity. Even the most avant-garde chefs in various nouvelle cuisines in several countries now who deconstruct and create new dishes now say they are inspired by their mother's cooking. It's part of what they like to say and traditional cuisine, their roots and their history. What they, what they use uh, is local ingredients. Now they say that part, uh, apart from giving pleasure and surprise, what they want to give is memories and emotions. It has become a mantra, really, of the chefs. When I interviewed the late revered Catalan chef Santi Santa Maria, he said, cooking has to be about sentiment as well as technique, and that without ideology, it is simply a matter of manual skills and technology. His ideology, he said, was rooted in the life of his peasant family and the progressive politics of his youth. He quoted the painter Juan Miró, to be universal, you have to be local. The reference points of his cooking, he said, were the memories of, the gra of his grandparents' generation and medieval Catalan cookbooks. Everybody's using medieval Catalan cookbooks at the moment and re-bringing out those. Now, food in Spain, I've got two more. Let me see, shall I take out about what? Uh, two and a half more pages. That two it's more. okay, it's but okay. we won't, won't have time for questions. So the question, if you want to do some time for questions. Or... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. Food in Spain is about local patriotism. During the Franco regime, regional cultures, including the Catalan language, were suppressed, and artisan products were discouraged in favor of mass industrial ones that could feed the population cheaply. After Franco's death, when people felt free to celebrate their regional heritage, organizations formed to preserve their culinary heritage by recording recipes. 900 were collected in Catalonia, 600 in the Balearic Islands uh, of Mallorca and Menorca, 900 in Galicia, uh, and, and it goes on and on. And producers rushed to obtain denominations of origin for their wines, their olive oils, their hams, their charcuterie, their cheeses, their beans, their lentils, their honeys, their cows, their pigs, their capons. Well, uh, uh, denominations of origins uh, are important. Uh, the way we cook and eat in Britain has changed for the better. When I first came to London in the 50s and 60s, food was limited and plain. It was also a taboo subject that caused embarrassed, embarrassment. Being a chef ranked as the lowest type of job. The only time families went out to dinner in a restaurant was to celebrate a birthday. I've been hearing that this was the case here too, <laughs> uh, uh, in Israel. Now, interest in food has exploded. Cooking is glamorous, chefs are venerated, eating is one, out is one of the most popular 
leisure activities, and cooking competitions are the most watched television programs. We have a new, exciting, and vibrant food scene with passionate cooks and artisans and the social elite that has become connoisseurs of food and wine. The majority, however, lived on, live still on ready-cooked meals and fast food. Now, food is also a hot subject for ac academic research. In the past, you never heard any, uh, you couldn't imagine any, uh, any uh, uh, university wanting a scholar to, to study food, except when it was uh, about women's studies, when it was about the drudgery that women have tied to in the kitchens. Now, we do have now a new elite culinary culture, and it's global. It's a global culture. It's innovative and subject to constantly changing fashions. Chefs are the driving force that create fashion, and inspiration comes from California, Spain, Denmark, Italy, and Israel. Can you believe it? Israel, Yotamo Tolenghi, Hani and Co., Palomar, on and on. Uh, uh, they have made the food fashionable. And food producers are, well, they, are, uh, they have made or they are part of it because it becomes, it becomes something, a wave. Uh, and food producers are on the lookout for the next big thing. Uh, because, yeah, we get asked, what is the next big thing? Because it takes a while to produce. So we've got to know, uh, but it has to be organic, sustainable, ethical, seasonal, and healthy. Also, in some cases, gluten-free, dairy-free. Well, you know all about it here. People try to cook like chefs, follow the fashions. They adopt superfoods and foraged foods and are, are very concerned with health. Vegetarianism and veganism have become mainstream. The latest global trends, though, are to revalue home cooking and to cherish regional cuisines. It's a response to globalization and has to do with no nostalgia for an old life and a fear of losing cultural identity. It, even Italian internet sites are now full of grandma's recipes, and sometimes you see a video of grandma cooking. A cookery, not only that, I mean there are now sites of Jewish Sephardi grandmothers cooking. I don't know if any of you are, are not uh, uh, technophobic like I am and find them at all. <laughs> a cookery writers used to be, and they still are, asked to send recipes that are original, unique, and different. You can't do a ratatouille or a boeuf bourguignon. It has to be different, so you put something else in that is different from editors. But now we are all asked for our mother's recipes and to describe our childhood kitchens and their smells. Well, we find that romantic nostalgia has a smell. In Spain, it is the smell of chorizos hanging in attics and kitchens. In most of the Mediterranean, it is of the tomatoes, onions, and garlic fried in olive oil. For me, the smells are of crushed coriander, garlic, frying, uh, uh, and garlic frying in oil, and the mingled smells of chicken, turmeric, lemon, and garlic. That's also frito. Well, when people phone to book a 250 pound tasting menu at Heston Blumenthal's Fat Duck. I think the price has gone up to 300 now, not counting, um, not counting the wine. Now they ask you, when you call to book, to name dishes remembered from your childhood so they can personalize your dinner and take you back to your childhood before whisking you into the future, right away. And now food is associated with love. Many products are said to be made with love. In America, a pot of yogurt I got uh, when I was touring, uh, uh, touring uh, at a university. I got it in a basket with a, a, f uh, a few uh, other foods 
in the pot it uh, was written that it was made with love from milk from cows of a special breed raised with love on fresh grass. Marks and Spencer's new spring promotion is entitled Made with Love. Their gastropub seafood, casserole, their beef bourguignon, their beetroot ravioli, and their sushi are all made with love. <laughs> now, when you cook yourself or somebody is the best way of showing love, really, that is. I recently participate, it, participate in a Dutch three-part television series, uh, which was called Love in Times of Turmoil. Now, um, I was filmed, I was in the, in the for the um, a program which was about all about food. Part of it, we were making food for asylum seekers, illegal immigrants, and love and rough sleepers with volunteers at the West London Synagogue in London. So it was really heartening to see the love the volunteers put into their cooking. And for me, it was the first time, and I was the chef on that occasion, and a pleasure to see how the spice lentil soup, vegetable couscous, and yogurt cake were appreciated. When, uh, when the volunteers went and joined um, the guests, guests were the illegal immigrants and so on at the long tables, they got a standing ovation. So uh, that we were really happy. Of course, food can also be used to oppress, to coerce and discriminate, to emphasize differences in ethnicity, religion and social status, and to separate one group from, for, from another. In France recently, when schools in areas where local councils, councils were dominated by the Front National, they refused to offer an alternative dish when pork is on the menu. It's seen as Islamophobic and is anti-Semitic. Well, as Eyal uh, and Yofi, I suppose as well, or Tamar, has shown in, uh, well, Eyal in his research in Gaza, restricting food and creating food insecurity can be used as an instrument of oppression and as a way of putting political and economic pressure. It's not all love. Well, I will end with an Arab saying, if you have shared food with someone, you can never betray them, as you have se sealed your relationship before God. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are just six minutes after the time we should have finished. So I think we should call it a day because it's been a long day. And we are just six minutes beyond schedule, which is not so bad. So thank you all for coming. Thanks to everyone who helped organize. And we said it before. And we are thanking them again. Uh, and I won't name them because we did it before. And special thanks to Claudia for coming, especially here, to deliver this talk. Thank you very much. And we hope you'll come again. Thank you.